Alright guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, today we're going to react to how Christianity is different from every religion by the channel Daily Dose of Wisdom. So I am a recent revert to Islam. However, I come from a Christian background, to be precise, from an Orthodox Christian background. And to be totally honest here, once you see the world through an Islamic lens, you see that every religion is actually the same except of Islam because they all follow the same doctrines. They do not worship God alone. They always attribute something to God. In Christianity, you have the Trinity, so you do worship Jesus. In Buddhism, it is even more complex, of course. They do not really believe in God. However, they do believe in the Buddha, in his way, and they worship him as a person. And the same thing yet again in Hinduism. Even in Hinduism, if you look into it in detail, you will see that there is one God. However, they do do worship a billion deities. So therefore, I make the bold claim over here that every religion is identical pretty much. They just appear to be different on the surface level. However, one religion truly stands out and that is Islam, the submission to one God alone. All right, guys, but with no further ado, let's have a look. I literally beg you to listen to this video at you least until the point me, where John Lennox here. gives his analogy about his wife and cooking because it is one mm. of the best analogies I've ever heard in explaining the difference between Christianity and every other religion. Mm. Let's go ahead and dive. It is so hilarious. Every couple of months or so you see a new Christian on YouTube being hyped up about a new uh, analogy. It was the same thing with the Trinity. But have you ever thought about the Trinity as an egg? The egg is three in one, is it not? You have the egg yolk, you have the egg white and you have the egg shell. It is three parts, but one egg after all. Every couple of months, a new analogy that you can wrap your head around. Islam doesn't need an analogy. We have the facts. In a society where we have access to many religions, how do we decide which one to follow? Well, I only know one way of deciding which of anything to believe is on the basis of evidence. Yes, please. You see... That makes sense. There's a confusion about faith. Many people have accepted Dawkins' definition of faith as believing where there's no evidence. That's nonsense. Faith is an ordinary word. It's not just a religious word. It's an ordinary word. It means trust. And usually, I suspect that all of you, you don't trust either facts or people without having evidence, or else you're a bit silly. I would make the claim that most people are silly, ignorant, and arrogant at the same time. I trust you with a loan Trump. unless you provide evidence of collateral, isn't that true? We all know what evidence-based faith is, but somehow, the word has been spread around by Dawkins and co that faith is a vice because it's believing where there's no evidence. That's nonsense. That is blind faith, and it's very yes, dangerous. Yes, absolutely. I would agree. This is blind faith. And to cut this whole video short, please explain and give me the evidence for the Trinity. Can you give me any evidence for the Trinity? If not, then it is blind faith. It's the kind of faith that causes young men to fly planes into tall buildings. Oh, that's, blind that's the blind faith. Christianity is I get it. Based. It's not like the Christian nations, the so-called Christian nations like America that send their soldiers to those Muslim countries. No, 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 of course not. It is the blind faith that led to 9-11. Listen to this. Yes. John, <laughs> at the end of his gospel, he says, smug old man. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but Why these are, they not? are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. In other words, here's the evidence on which faith is based. Now, how do you decide between religions? No, in other words, you're simply talking about a text now. The text itself is not evidence because we have to question ourselves where did that text come from? Who wrote that text? And the matter of fact is that we do not know. We have no idea who those authors of the New Testament are. And moreover, the New Testament has been written in Greek. Jesus nor his disciples talked Greek. So therefore, who are those people? Surely not the disciples of Christ. Just look into it. You will find it yourself. Some of those texts have been written over a hundred of years after Jesus Christ. So therefore, those texts are not reliable. So how can you tell me then that you have evidence? You don't even know the authors of those texts. Well, there are several ways. 
Very briefly. Really quick, before he gets into this, I think it's interesting that, because I'm putting myself in the mindset of the maybe more skeptical viewer of this video, Are and you? I know that there's going to be this complaint, well, that's John, who is in this book called The Bible, so he's biased and illegitimate for that reason, but it's interesting to note that yeah, as I said, it's not only John, it is the other authors as well that we do not know who those people are in the first place. So this is, of course, a legitimate reason not to trust in those texts. John, How can you? When he wrote that, didn't even know that there was going to be this, you know, canonized thing called the Bible that was going to be included with all of these other books and sort of put together in the way that it is today. He's just a, a real person who experienced real events in history and is proclaiming the reality of those events to, but he never met jesus to to the original audience and i just oh. think that's interesting to i think sometimes we can put the cart before the horse in terms of quickly discrediting a a eyewitness to events in history so that but he was not an eyewitness man being said let's what let's are you talking about continue. just so think strange. of the three major monotheistic religions Judaism, Let's. Christianity, and Islam. When it comes to Christ, my Jewish friends, and I have many of them, believe that Christ died and did not rise. I, as a Christian, believe he died and rose. My Muslim friends believe he didn't die. Those three things cannot be simultaneously true. And therefore, I simply invite people to investigate agree. the evidence and one of the right. most seminal experiences in my life was sitting on the ground in a bright sunshine in Trinity College, Cambridge, listening to one of the world's top lawyers, actually an expert in Islamic law, but a Christian. And he was a Queen's Counsel, amongst many other things. Sir Norman Anderson, I think his book is still obtainable. And he got up and says, I want to do a forensic investigation of the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. Right. And the place was absolutely packed, and I'll never forget it, because that was the beginnings of understanding that there is a rational forensic defense hmm. of this. And we have to make up our own minds. But there's another method of approach, and it's this. But he's not you saying see, anything, man. Of every worldview and religion, I ask several questions. Oh man, why do you make it so complicated and why do you talk so slow? The fact is, you mentioned the three main Abrahamic faiths. Even though I disagree with that terminology, I believe that Islam is the only Abrahamic faith because Islam practices what Abraham practiced. Very, very simple. Abraham was not a Jew. Abraham was not a Christian. Abraham submitted his will to God. It went so far that he would have sacrificed his only son. This is true submission to God. This is his religion i.e. Islam. Islam means submission to God. Case closed. But let's dive into the simple statements of those faiths. Judaism says there is only one God. He is one. Echad. But then it displays God in ways that is not befitting to him. For example, God needs rest or God lost a wrestling match against a human being, etc. etc. So this God is not all powerful. Then Christianity comes around and all of a sudden God is three in one. What is your evidence? for that. Jesus never spoke about a trinity. This is a later invention at the Council of Nicaea. Finally, they come to the conclusion that the trinity is the true God. Jesus never spoke about this and no other prophet spoke about this. However, this is the main claim of Christianity. Christianity claims that the real God is triune. And moreover, you should pray to Jesus. We have saints, we venerate Mother Mary, etc., etc., you name it. And in Islam, on the other hand, we worship an all-powerful God, which is uniquely one. That's it. That is the main claim of Islam. God is one. He doesn't need rest. He's not like a human being. That's what the Bible says as well. By the way, nothing in creation is like God. God. Which religion makes more sense? And moreover, where is the evidence for the other claims? Where is the evidence for the Trinity? Don't get me even started. Where is the claim for God losing in a wrestling match against a human being? There is no evidence.
evidence for that whatsoever. Moreover, all the textual evidence that Christianity delivers is not bulletproof. As I said, most of the time we don't even know the authors. How can we trust it? Comes to Yet again, it does make sense. I ask, what is the shape of the religion? Okay. How is relationship with God determined? So let's just confine ourselves for sake of illustration to God-fearing religions, not religions that don't really believe in God and so on, yeah. but God-fearing religions like the three I've mentioned. And what I discover by constant questioning of people is that there's a general pattern, that there's some sort of initiation rite perhaps performed on a child, perhaps performed on an adult, and the person sure. is on Baptism. the way. And the descriptor, the way, is often used, and I often draw this, and I draw a little door you get in, and a wavy line, this is the way it goes up and down, and then there's a gate, another big door at the far end, and I draw the scales of justice there. And at the hmm. other side of that gate is nirvana, heaven, what have you, paradise. Okay. And I say, as you're on the way, you have various people that teach you and help you and so on, but even they cannot guarantee your acceptance into heaven or whatever at the end. Wow. Yeah, neither can you, only God can. See? That's because it. Because you have to go through the final assessment, a judgment. Yes, true. And why is that? Because the principle of the religion is merit. Hmm. And so you have to hope that with all the teaching you've got and all the experience, that your good deeds will outweigh your bad deeds and you'll be accepted. That is not accurate either and it's a misconception about Islam in particular. Sure, we are commanded to do good deeds, but in the end it is God who decides if we will enter heaven or not. Lawrence, most people it's say not due that's to the good exactly deeds. what we believe. And I say, it's exactly not what I believe. And they say, of course you do. You're a Christian. You believe as well as no, Christians don't I believe do that. that good works are important. Yes, I say, I believe they're important, but they're not the basis of acceptance. No, same I say, in Islam. How can that possibly be? Well, I say, you think of that wavy line. Ah, uh, Jesus died for your sins, therefore you get a free entry ticket into paradise. We get it. However, as I said, in Islam, it is not only based upon your good deeds. It is based upon what God decides. And you're Simple. on that wavy line, and you cannot, by definition, be sure of acceptance. It's like Birmingham University. Yeah, we don't know. You get in, you do your A-levels, wonderful, you're in, and then there are nice professors like me teaching you, but I can't guarantee you get a degree. Why? Because you have to get through finals. Yeah, you can't. That's the day of judgment, folks, isn't it? That's right. And many of you remember it. And that is what the vast majority of people think a religion is. And then I drop a little bomb. Let's go. Into their minds. And I say, but that isn't Christianity, folks. In religion, acceptance comes at the end on the basis of an assessment of merit. Well, if that's religion, Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. And acceptance comes at the beginning. It's the claim that's of radical. every religion. That's not and radical. you know, I believe in our country, and in my original country, many people have rejected Christianity. Why? Because they've never understood this. They don't realize that Christianity is not a merit-based religion. Because Christ came into our world, and he told us. What did he tell us? Did he go against the prophets? No, he said he came to fulfill the law. He did not come to go against the former prophets. All those former prophets said that God is one. We should worship God alone. No idol worship. No worshiping the golden calf, etc., etc. You name it. It's always the same message. And Jesus did not go against that message. It is not as Christians say that Jesus said now we should worship three in one or that we should worship 
worship him. This is not the message of Jesus. And guess what? Newsflash, Jesus was not a Christian. Ooh, there you go. That if we listened to him and accepted his word and believed on him as the savior, the son of God, we would have in that moment eternal life and we would not come into judgment. That's utterly radical. No, it's not utterly radical. That's what all the prophets said as well. We have to believe in God and the messenger. And his message is the transmission of God. If we follow the messenger, we are following God. It is not radical at all. It is always the same message. So the acceptance comes at the beginning. It's the same with Islam. The first step of Islam, the first pillar is the Shahada. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasul Allah. Which means there is no God worthy of worship but God. And Muhammad is his messenger. The same would have applied during the time of Jesus. There is no God worthy of worship but God. And Jesus is his messenger. Moses is his messenger. Abraham is his messenger. Noah is his messenger. It was always the same message, don't you see? I don't give lectures like this and discussions like this to earn God's forgiveness. Okay. I do them because I got it. <laughs> That's radical. The and you one. all understand that. Let me ram this in with a little illustration. Can I do that? Only take a minute. Go on then. <laughs> Wait, this is it then. Yeah. You've, heard my, you've heard about my wife. <laughs> I love. Well, over 50 years ago, I saw this vision in Cambridge. So I decided I'd like to marry her. So I came to her one day and I had a little present wrapped up for her. It was a cookbook. <laughs> so I said, I'd like to marry you, Sally. Now the condition would be this. Let's look at page 147. It's apple cake. And here are the laws for making apple cake. Thou shalt take so much flour, thou shalt take so much sugar, da, 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 and there you are. Now, here's the way it's going to be. If you keep these laws for the next 40 years, I'll think about accepting you. <laughs> if you don't, you can go back to your mother. <laughs> but look. Why are you laughing? Yeah, they should laugh, but not because of the reason they are laughing. Ultimately, it is laughable because Christians always anthropomorphize and they cannot help it, of course, because their God is a human being. Once you accept God as a human being in the form of a human being, you're worshiping men, then anything goes. Every example, every analogy then will be based upon a man-made subject. This is what you see here. This man in this instance is God and he is giving the law to his wife and she has to obey those laws. Ultimately, it is a joke, of course, because like that you're discrediting the Old Testament altogether. Everything that has been revealed to the prophets, you are mocking, you are laughing at. All of those laws that have been sent down to us humans, all of a sudden are invalid. All of a sudden we don't need them anymore. Now we can sit there, we can sin, we can do whatever we want, works do not count whatsoever, and we are forgiven. This is a satanic Doctrine. It's what many Unreal, of you man. sitting here think about God. And you would never insult a fellow human being by basing a relationship on merit. You wouldn't. Oh no, you wouldn't? What are you talking about, man? As a human being, absolutely you would. What God does is up to God. We don't know his ways. We cannot fully comprehend it. However, as a human, you do not love unconditionally. That is an absolute scam, of course. You found your wife back then attractive. So therefore, one of the conditions was her beauty. It is what it is. It was her beauty. It was her youth. It was her fertility. It was something about her that you found attractive and valuable. And because you found it valuable, this is why you entered the marriage. This is why you love her in the first place. It is based upon the condition. And the same applies to your your wife as well. There was something attractive about you that she admired, she needed, and therefore she fell in love with you. This is why she got married with you. We humans always love conditionally and we're entering relationships conditionally. Otherwise you would love everybody in that room and you would have the same relationship with everybody in that room, which you do not have. However, yet again, all of this is human. You are a human. The way that you have relationships does not apply to God. Surprise. And so my marriage, it's been good. Why? Because 
My wife is not cooking in order pie. to gain my acceptance. She likes cooking because she's got it. And the wonderful thing about Christianity is precisely that. It's not religion. But how is this different from any other religion? When we do something, we do it for the sake of God, because God loves it. Do you think in Islam we do it to earn points? What kind of ridiculous statement is this? We, of course, do it for the sake of God. In that sense. What is it? It's this? a relationship. It's that sense of acknowledgement of <sighs> our need for God, of our own moral depravity, of yes, the fact that we, need we are God. not holy in and of ourselves as he is. He is perfect and perfectly holy correct and he wants to have relationship with us how do, how do you square that circle how can god re relate yeah we disagree you? here i don't think that god wants a relationship with us if he wanted a relationship with us he would have it it's just that simple just the way that the angels see god if he wanted us to see him he would have done it it's that simple for god this is easy we need God. We are of need of God. And we are created in a certain way. Everything has a specific nature created by God, just as we men are created to procreate with a female and create a family. Then we take on the nature of being a father, taking care of our children. Those are relationships dictated by God. If we go against them, we experience the suffering right here. And the same applies to the relationship between us and God. We are commanded to worship one God alone as Muslims. If we do not do that, we suffer a depressed life because we go against the nature of humans created by God. God created us to worship him alone. We can do whatever we want. We can go against God. However, the result is suffering yet again. How do, how do you square that circle? How can God Re relate to and unite himself to a species that is unsuitable for him based on based on the way that we have exercised our own free will and fallen and the way that collectively and individualistically every single person has fallen short of the glory of God and yet God still wants us. The scriptures are riddled with this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. We were his enemies, and he and he came for us. Um, that we were orphans that he had done. Yeah, in Islam, we do not prescribe to the doctrine of the original sin. It is quite uplifting. It is quite positive because we relate to the fitra. The fitra is the natural predisposition of man to worship one God alone. And guess what? God's gift is that we can return to that fitra, to that natural predisposition, and worship God alone. Yet again. Again, this is Islam. Every child, every baby is created beautifully, perfectly by God in a state of a pure fitra, in the natural state, in the understanding that there is one God. Later on then, the parents teach us that we have to worship Jesus, that we have to worship Krishna, that we have to worship multiple deities, etc., etc., you name it. However, in Islam, we believe that we have not fallen. We are created perfectly and then our parents might teach us something that goes against our nature. Society might teach us something that goes against our nature. The good news is we can return to our nature. Adopted, etc., etc. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is it is literally littered throughout the entire New Testament. This idea... Yes, absolutely. It is littered through the New Testament. However, in the Old Testament, you cannot find it. And what does it truly mean? Jesus died for our sins. Now our sins are forgiven. Now we are lifted out of that fallen state. However, the original sin still exists. Some Christians take the position that Jesus died for the original sin. Other Christians take the position that Jesus died for sin, period. However, what does that lead to? Now we find our ourselves still in a fallen state apparently because if you look around people still sin however yet again if jesus died for our sins then we do not need to do anything but accept jesus into our life and that's it then we can go on about our life and we can keep on sinning because jesus died for us how does this make sense that we have radically fallen short that we're desperately in need at the same time we're desperately yes, we're deeply need, sure. loved by god in spite of that in spite of the fact that we're rebelling against him constantly and that he's made a way that his like he said it's not merit based because if it were no one would ever be with god we cannot reach to the to the heights of what is necessary to become suitable creatures for him only through 
that beautiful atonement that took place. I think you're aiming for an unrealistic standard here. God, after all, created us with intent. He knew why he created us. Even the angels, according to the Quran, asked him why he would create a creature that causes bloodshed. But God said to the angels, I know something that you do not know, meaning that God is all knowing and hence he has his plan and he is the best of planners. We cannot understand why he does certain things. However, it cannot be so complicated the way that you portray it here to gain God's favor. Why would it be? The Old Testament, the Quran, the Torah tells us exactly what we need to do. We need to worship one God alone. And yes, we need to do good deeds as well. We need to become better people. Go figure. We're not just forgiven because Jesus died for us. No, we need to consistently improve ourselves. However, God is the most merciful. And it is ultimately in his hands if we will go to paradise or not. But what I'm saying here is, in Islam, we have certain commandments, certain pillars that we follow. We are fasting, we are praying five times per day, we are giving to charity. Those are the things that we have to observe as Muslims. Why? Because God commanded us to do so. However, the Christians say they do not need to do anything, nothing is commanded to them, and they believe that God will forgive them anything as long as they proclaim that Jesus is their Lord. Again, how does this make sense? It doesn't. The cross, only through God himself, heroically living the life that we couldn't live, dying the death that we deserved to die, absorbing the wrath that was, that, that was towards our sin, and then conquering death and rising again. Only, only if that is true is there hope for humanity. There is no other possible system or worldview or ideology or way that can square the circle of the fundamental problem of the holiness of God and the okay. depravity of man. It is only on that old rugged cross that the solution it ha has been offered that is actually legitimate. No. That is an ideology of despair, if you ask me. It's actually very saddening and depressing. Because ultimately what you're saying there is that God has a wrath upon us humans. He's wrathful against us because we are so sinful. But you're talking about a God that created us. He knew certainly how we will play out. He knew what kind of creature we are when he created us. But let's give you the benefit of the doubt. God is wrathful against us. He holds a grudge against us. And now the only way he can forgive us is by sending his only son. However, plot twist, his son is God himself. And now God kills himself on the cross because yet again, he's so angry at us and we deserve that death. However, because he loves us as well, he's kind of schizophrenic, he hates us, he loves us, he sacrifices himself. But then, go figure, he actually doesn't die. Whoopsie, what a trick. He dies as a sacrifice to forgive sins. However, he does not die at all because three days later he is rising into the heavens back to God, which he is in the first place. And now you're telling me this is the only way anything makes sense. Their claimant wow, in religion and in, in any other religion, whether it's Buddha, Muhammad, etc., none, none of, no one else is offering us the solution to the problem that we have. No one else has actually even claimed to do this thing. Worship one God alone, <laughs> pray fast. That Jesus has claimed to do. And then I love no. at the beginning of this when Linux says it is a matter of fact, it is a matter of, it, it is evidence-based. I love that he goes there. Where is the evidence? That's exactly what the, the ancient church believed. Paul Where says that if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then we're the most pitied of all because we've placed our hope in an illusion. But here's the good I news agree. today, folks. He did. Yeah, makes sense. He all right, guys. I'm going to cut it off here. The video is long enough. You get the point. He's talking about evidence, 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 evidence. But ultimately, there is no hard evidence. Not historically. And of course, not if you look into the Bible. As I said throughout the video, the New Testament has been written by... Who knows? We have absolutely no clue who wrote it. We don't have the original names of the Apostles of Christ. Do you believe they were really called Matthew and Mark? Yay! Moreover, as my Muslim viewers know as well, there are contradictions within the New Testament and within the Old Testament as well. If you truly observe the Bible in detail, you put it under scrutiny, it cannot pass the test. But what I observe with those Christian apologists is that they always claim that Christianity is different and therefore 
it is true, therefore it must be true. However, Christianity sprung out of Judaism, and this is the environment that Jesus Christ grew up in. He was a Jew. Jesus grew up in a Jewish environment. He was going to the temple. He was preaching in that temple, and moreover, he was called a rabbi. And therefore, if you want to be historical about this, you just have to ask yourself what Jesus preached. And even if you take your own Bible as evidence, you will see that Jesus always puts the focus away from him onto God. He always says, worship one God. And this is why Islam is nothing new. In Islam, we do not believe that Islam came with Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We do not believe that Islam was founded during the time of Prophet Muhammad either. What we believe is that Islam is the submission to God that has always existed from the beginning of time. We believe that the angels are in submission to God. We believe that Adam, the first man, was in submission to God. We, of course, believe that all the prophets are in submission to God. We even believe that all the creatures, the animal kingdom, all of it is in submission to God. We as humans have, of course, the choice, the free will that you mentioned as well. We can rebel against God to our own detriment, of course. And like this, we are not in submission, but in rebellion. Those are the two options. And this is truly what religion boils down to. Submission is the true religion, where we are submitting our will, we're getting away from our ego, we're submitting everything we have to the one God. The other option is rebellion, rebellion against God. Of course, you can go to an extreme, become a Satanist, sacrifice a cat. So yeah, then you are really extremely rebelling against God. But there is minor rebellion against the will of God as well. When you think that it should go your way, you go throughout the day, you are grumpy, you're not happy with your situation because you think it should be a certain way. But well, God planned it otherwise. And then there is the rebellion that is a great sin in Islam, which is called shirk. Every time we attribute other things to God, partners, for example, like in your case here, you're not worshipping the pure one God anymore, but now you started worshipping a man, a prophet. So you're deviating from the pure monotheism. In Islam, that is a huge problem. In Islam, this is a sin. This is shirk, as I said. So therefore, the trick that the devil played on you here is that you believe that you are pious by not needing to follow anything and worshipping a man rather than God. God. Maybe you should think twice. All right, guys, but this is it for today's video. If you liked it, leave the thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, guys, please do so. And if you want to support this channel via Patreon or via merch, all the links are in the description box below. Thank you so much for your ongoing support, guys. And as always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace.